I'm finally continuing my review of HBO's Rome, and I think I published the last part like three years ago, so it's about fucking time for me to get back to it. We're currently at season one, episode three, which is called uh, An Owl in a Torn Bush. I actually never got the reference of this title, so anyone feel free to explain what's with this weird episode title. I even tried googling the meaning because I thought it was like a set phrase or something, but no, apparently there's no such phrase in the English language, and the episode is just called like that for some reason. So we're about uh, 27 minutes into the episode, and we come across a scene where, uh, by the night fire, Pulo and Varinus are looking at the stars, and Pulo asks what they are. Varinus goes to explain that the stars are just holes in the celestial dome, and their light is the light that um, emanates from the heavens. And that the stars might seem small to us, but that's because they're just far away, and in reality they're big. You know, historically, there's nothing significant about that scene, but there's a cultural aspect to it, a psychological aspect that's very much relevant even today. This scene is a perfect depiction of a, how should I call it, a presumptuous ass that kind of thinks he's so smart that he doesn't even question his own logic. I mean, just compare the two archetypes we have in this scene, and in life in general. On the one hand, we just have the person who is not presumptuous, specifically speaking about Pulo. He just looks at the stars and asks, what are they? He asks himself, he asks the others around him, he's just interested and open to ideas and interpretations. He doesn't assume anything, he just looks and explores. And in our own real life, we all know people like that, who are analytical, who don't make judgments or assumptions for no reason, who are simply open-minded. And then on the other hand, we have the embodiment of the asshole who thinks he knows everything. Varinas goes on to explain to us not only how the skies are built, he not only knows how large the holes are in the celestial sphere, but he's also very certain that, in contrast to him, Pulo does not know what he's talking about. Because when Pulo suggests that you can probably reach the holes in the dome by latching onto a bird, which in theory doesn't sound any more ridiculous than Varinus' holes in the dome theory, Varinus just cuts him off by saying it doesn't work like that. Like. What sort of an explanation is that? And why should we even take it as legitimate? The guy says you can fly up to the stars with a bird, and you say no because no. Well, thanks, that's stupid. And of course, in our lives, we all know people like that, uh, like Varinas, I mean. They just know. Something is whatever because they say it is. They don't feel the need to explain or validate their statements in front of others. We're just supposed to take it for granted because it comes from them. It's snobbishness, it's the worst kind of stupidity one can encounter, because there's two kinds of stupidity in the world. One is a harmless stupid, where it's just neutral, harmless, and completely uninterested in whatever the fucking truth is. It's like the kind of stupid that doesn't bite. And then there's the dangerous kind of stupid. These are people like uh, religious preachers, or fanatics, or biblical literalists, or any kind of person that's convinced of their own views without feeling the need to question or justify those views. It's the self-righteous people who try to impose themselves on others for the sake of influence and not honesty. And I'm not saying Varinus is that big of an asshole as a character, um, at least not as far as astronomy goes, but this scene is a metaphor for the kind of asshole he is when it comes to his moral stances and his behavior in life. He doesn't question his own motives and actions. He lives by an already established system of moral laws, and he follows these without question. He might not preach to people about the stars being holes in the sphere, but he does pull out a knife on his own wife. He does get close to killing a little child, Niobe's baby from her adultery. And he does all this monstrosity only based on his moral understanding of honor. Unquestioning, unjustified honor. 
And so this is why I love this scene so much. It's such a simple scene, such a short dialogue about something that sounds pretty much irrelevant to the story, and yet it isn't. I think this scene is a wonderful psychological portrait of the two main characters, and it puts them both in contrast uh, to each other wonderfully. And maybe I'm reading too much into it, but that's why I'm a nerd. I love this kind of thing. Now the next scene is historically significant. We witness a very interesting exchange at Atia's house. Now that it looks like Pompey's losing and Caesar's winning, all supporters of Pompey have left Rome, and those who after all chose to stay have to come to Caesar's family and kiss their asses. A man and a woman, who were former Pompey supporters, now come to Atia to switch alliances, and they're literally lying face down on the floor, kissing her feet, because they want to preserve their fortune and property. And of course, Atia being the conniving Hollywood shark that she is, is being all nice and sweetness, saying, please stand up, you don't need to do this. And of course, we all know, and they know, that indeed they had to do this. She wanted to see their humiliation, otherwise she would have had them killed. Her smile quickly modes into a face of disgust and cruelty, and she tells them she wants a uh, 5,000 denarii as tribute. And I'm not sure what this would be in modern currency, but I imagine it's a sum that would totally drain and bankrupt them, which uh, in Atia's view would be a small price to pay provided that she let them live. Then in the next scene we see Pompey's forces moving away from Rome, and Cato bitching about how uh, logistically impossible their retreat and return would be, like uh, feeding the legions and such. And Pompey still sounds uh, confident when trying to calm them down about everything being alright. It's a good actor though, uh, Kenneth Cranum or whatever way his name is pronounced. He managed to speak confidently, while deep down actually looking desperate. You can see it in his eyes that uh, behind it, the brave rhetoric, he's thinking, what the fuck did I do? How am I gonna handle this? And uh, then we return to Varinus's annoying sense of morality. Uh, they're standing outside of the city, and he's wondering why Pompey's soldiers, the soldiers of the Republic, are not defending the city against the incoming usurper that is Julius Caesar. It cannot be. How can they not be defending it? The soldiers of the Republic do not run, he says. I mean, people are not fallible. That's fucking impossible. It just can't be the people who disprove my morals. It's more like that. If things are not as I expect them to be, it's not because people aren't perfect, it's because the gods have abandoned us. He says Mars would not allow such a disgrace, and oh my god, I'm losing brain cells while even processing that line. And then Pulo says, in my line of thinking, uh, maybe Mars was taking a crap, and that's why he missed to see that he left the city undefended. That's my Pulo. You go ahead and make fun of that idiot's logic. Make fun of religion, make fun of people's presumptions. Show them that they're presumptuous, self-righteous assholes. You know, now that I think about it, that's probably the writer's idea uh, behind the entire dynamic between these two characters. They're like the two opposites who weirdly attract a double star dancing around the core of the relationship, if you will. The two ends of the same stick, connected for the sake of drama and storytelling. And as much as I like it, it does look a bit unrealistic to me that two such characters could really become the best of friends in real life. They'd be ideologically and psychologically too opposed to be able to maintain a sincere friendship. For example, me personally, I'd never be able to really be friends with a person like Varinus. I'd just be quiet for like a day or two until I can't take it anymore and then uh, verbally destroy them before walking away. But then again, perhaps we have to take into account the military context of the situation. But they're not just two people who met or whatever, they're soldiers who had to fight together, and maybe that's what their opposing relationship is successfully nurtured by. And I'll end this part of the review here, next to come is part 5 of this episode, and I'll try not to wait another 3 fucking years before making it. <laughs>